Um, I don't know how many of you get parking today. I get parking today on a regular basis, and I think you were on the cover not too long ago, and I don't know if they said the God of parking, but it was something similar because they always refer to this book as the actual Bible of parking. And he's, uh, and I guess if you become a real supporter uh, in the parking community, you become a shoebista. Is that right, I think? And so what we're really talking about is the rock star of parking is with us today. This is very exciting for us. Um, and, uh, and I could go on and on, but Dr. Shoup is a, a professor at, the, at UCLA in LA, and he has been absolutely at the forefront of explaining how does parking really work as opposed to how do you think it works. <laughs> so with that, thank you very much, Dr. Shoup. Well, thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. It's an honor to be among such a great group of speakers and a pleasure to be uh, here with an audience who all understand that bad parking policies mess, mess everything else up in the city. Um, Parking is important. Uh, the average car is parked 95% of the time. Uh, some of you were probably even conceived in a parked car. Um, I was uh, 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 pleased to be called a parking rock star, but I, I know that's not the same as a real rock star, although uh, um, I have thought about changing my name to uh, Shoot Dog. Uh, <laughs> Um, and I was surprised when the, the, the Wall Street Journal called me the Yoda of urban planning until I remember that Yoda was 800 years old. Um, um, let me see. So that's the way people, and he, he also seemed to speak mainly nonsense, uh, that I couldn't understand anything that he was talking about. Um, uh, well, uh, it's embarrassing for somebody from Los Angeles to be asked to, uh, to lecture anybody else about what to do about the city planning or parking or transportation or anything else. Uh, but uh, I think this view of Silicon Valley uh, represents what's wrong with most of America. That um, this is the, the Cisco Systems campus, uh, if you want to call that a campus. Uh, that uh, it's. Uh, let me see. Let me get this up here. It's. Um, it goes on for, for miles in Silicon Valley. Uh, and you wonder, and when you get down close to it, almost all of it is free parking. And here is a shopping center in, in, in Jefferson Parish. That uh, California isn't the only place with an awful lot of parking. Um, and when you get down close to it, and this is on Citrus Boulevard, they must have chopped down all the citrus trees so you can see the parking. And some of these uh, aerial views give an unflattering view of uh, vision of the city. Here's what it looks like on the ground. Uh, uh, so uh, we don't have, we have a lot to be embarrassed about in California, but so does every place else. And I think the urban planning profession is responsible for much of this uh, mess we're in. Here's their latest publication on parking requirements called Parking Standards. Who's against standards? It sounds like a good idea, high standards. Everybody's in favor of that. But there's really nothing to do with standards. It just says, what are the parking requirements that all other cities have done? It doesn't say how to set them or why you set them. It just says what other cities' parking requirements are. And there are eight pages of land uses with parking requirements. Requirements. This just gets down to boarding house on this page. Um, so planners somehow have to know how much every one of these uh, land uses uh, uh, needs in parking. Uh, there, there are 10 different kinds of adult land uses. Uh, we, we don't have to explain anything about what adult means in this, in this context. But here is the picture that they, that they use to illustrate uh, an adult land use. And you saw the, the cover of the of the uh, book was nothing but park cars, and here is what we're supposed to inspire us: is how to to um, 
uh, set parking requirements. Uh, well, each parking requirement taken by itself uh, seems sensible, especially if you could relate it to the number of people. Uh, although there are usually gender distinctions, which are a little bit hard to understand. But it, it makes sense that you need a parking space for the barber and for the person in the barber chair, and maybe somebody waiting. Um, uh, <laughs> and the land uses uh, always seem to require more than one person, one car per person, except for religious land uses. And even then, there's a uh, gender discrimination. But once you get away from the number of people, it's hard to know how many parking spaces per what. And when you look at them, it usually is per thousand square feet. And that sounds like they've thought about what's necessary. Uh, and then when you get 1,000 per square feet, you have to have a parking space per something. Well, maybe that makes sense. Um, some land uses are harder than, than, than that, but I mean, you really can't have anything built unless it's at the required parking. So in order for development to proceed, you have to have a parking requirement, even for the afterlife. Um, well, I think we made two mistakes in parking policies in the United States. Uh, one is to keep curb parking free or cheap. Even no matter how valuable the land, the parking ought to be free. And since the city owns the streets, and uh, the politicians make the decisions on how much parking should cost, it's usually free or cheap. And then in order to prevent that from creating chaos on the street, they have to require lots of off-street parking. Uh, here's the parking requirements in San Jose. Uh, the red is the size of the parking lot, and the green is the size of the building. Um, and so for most land uses, the parking lot is bigger than the building. And I think for each city, when you look at these parking requirements, it tells you something about uh, you know, what they value. Uh, auction houses, uh, I mean, how many days a month do they have auctions. Uh, <laughs> and when you look at these uh, parking requirements in the code, we've been looking at a lot of codes, they look kind of scientific. It looks as though somebody has thought very carefully about uh, how much should be required, even down to decimal point, you know, 3.3 spaces per thousand square feet or something like that. Um, uh, here is New Orleans' minimum parking requirements. And you can see what New Orleans values. I guess uh, either everybody drives to a church or they don't want many churches. And they make it difficult to build them uh, and very expensive to build them. And I guess they want everybody to come to their funerals and, and have marching bands. The band has to have a place to park, I suppose. Uh, and here are uh, New Orleans' uh, parking requirements. Uh, except for the CBD and, and, and the French Quarter. They look like they're thought through very carefully. Somebody must have estimated this or look, looked at some manual. It looks scientific, but it's not. It, it, it's a pretense uh, that planners have to pretend that they know how many parking spaces are required, but the politicians demand it. That if you are, are asked to say, well, how many parking spaces should we require for a funeral? home, you can't go back to the council and say, I don't know. <laughs> you would be fired. Uh, so I think the planners are put in a position, they have to say something, and they don't know what to say. Um, and, and people think that there's a terrible shortage of parking, because most of the parking that you can see, certainly at the curb and in the ground floor of parking, shed, uh, you know, parking garages, are uh, uh, they're either full or they're great Lots of oil stains showing that they're well used. But when you go to the top deck of the parking structure, you often don't see a single oil stain. And I always go to the top of parking structures because you get a great view of the city. This is from of the Hollywood Hills. It's in West Hollywood where everybody says there's a terrible shortage of curb parking. And we need more. Well, uh, the last time I was in New Orleans, I stayed in a hotel in the French Quarter. Right out my window was the top deck of a parking garage. Um, um, and New Orleans has a lot of uh, parking garages, including one right next to this building, an eight-story parking garage with uh, one car on top when I got up in the morning. And this is in the French Quarter. Right across the street, there's another parking garage. 
uh, who, where, and where in the world do you think that people complain more about a shortage of parking than in the French Quarter? Um, well, uh, the problem is that most of these parking spaces are, are built because the cities require them. It isn't the developer's fault. The developers are simply following the, uh, the, the parking requirements. And, uh, uh, parking talked about, Jeff Dyer talked a little about parking requirements, but he didn't say how many spaces are required of the smart code. Even the smart code has parking requirements. Um, and they seem just as arbitrary to me as to others. Because the, uh, the the planners who are asked to set them, they don't know how much the spaces cost, and how can you know how many spaces are required if you don't know how much they cost? And in many cases, they're wildly expensive. UCLA's most recent garage costs eighty-four thousand dollars a space, <laughs> and yet the spaces are needed, aren't they? Um, uh, and the uh, planners don't know how much the parking requirements increase the cost of everything else. The housing, uh, uh, theaters, restaurants, funeral homes. Um, or how they affect urban design. How does the city look as the result of all this parking? And we've seen a lot of wonderful slides showing that these required parking spaces uh, blight the landscape. Uh, that uh, it's, 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 it's an asphalt wasteland in, in large parts of our city. Um, and the, uh, the, the free parking is a fossil fuel subsidy. And even the parking lots are made of fossil fuel if they're asphalt. So. Um, uh, certainly, I think that minimum parking requirements increase congestion because they certainly make it easier to drive a car. Um, and the more you drive, the more you pollute the air. At the, um, and now we have to understand that it affects CO2 emissions, so that that's a, a, a new concern. I'm actually happy about global warming because, because it makes us realize we're doing so many bad things. There's so many things we shouldn't be doing, uh, regardless of CO2, that I think CO2 is making us aware that we have uh, very badly misplaced priorities. I think that if we got most of our cities in the way that the speakers today are talking about, we would have much less CO2 emissions. And you can feel that you're taking the high ground on that regard. Um, and then planners have no education on how to set parking requirements. I've been to many universities around the country, and I always ask them, do you have any instruction on how to set a parking requirement? Well, no, they don't. The only thing that the student, planning students learn about parking requirements is it makes it hard for them to do everything they want to do, affordable housing or infill development or anything like that. As soon as they do their pro formas, they find that the parking requirements make what they want to do and why they went into a planning school impossible. Um, so I think the problem is that these parking requirements, they governmentalize what should be a private decision. We're not talk I'm not talking about privatization as a problem. I'm talking about governmentalizing something as a, as, as a problem. It should not be a government decision, how many parking spaces there are. The, the, the new urbanists are exactly right in regulating parking, and the, the location, the appearance, uh, the um, uh, accessibility for uh, disabled people. There are lots of things that should be regulated about parking, but not the number of spaces, because nobody knows how many spaces are needed, except the developer and the drivers who are going to park into it. So they politicized Parker. Uh, and one of the, the best presents you could give to a city council is to remove parking from their agenda. That they wouldn't have to uh, have council meetings that last till midnight on whether to raise the price of parking by 25 cents an hour, uh, or whether they should uh, give a variance to some uh, affordable housing that, that uh, would rather have less parking. Well, I recommend three basic reforms that I think would help to uh, alleviate the situation. And they're, they're incremental. I think that I think they're politically uh, doable. One is charge the right price for curb parking. Who could object to charging the right price for curb parking? But that means what, what is the definition of right? And by that, I mean it's the lowest price the city can charge and still have uh, one or two open spaces on every block. So that wherever you go, you can't say there's 
there's a shortage of parking because there's an open space right on the block where you want to be. Everybody would have great parking karma. Somehow, an open space appears right when you get to your destination. Uh, and then to make that politically possible, I recommend spending the meter revenue on the street with the meter. So that the, uh, be very flamboyant about what you do with meter money. Say that it, 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 it uh, uh, steam cleans the sidewalks and takes off all the black chewing gum polka dots that uh, we've become hardened to, to uh, somehow accept as a, a, something a natural phenomenon. Um, uh, and then once you do those two things, I think you can uh, reduce or eliminate the off-street parking requirements, and that will make all kinds of wonderful developments possible. The, the developer won't, will, will decide how many parking spaces they think they should provide for their customers, rather than having somebody tell them what to do and they have to comply. So these, uh, I'd like to describe by these three in order. One is the performance-based parking prices, uh, that uh, they, because demand adjust over time and the supply is fixed, the price has to change over time to uh, uh, ensure a few vacant spaces most of the time. Uh, about 85% occupancy is what uh, engineers and planners recommend. Uh, uh, that's about one out of every eight spaces should be empty. Um, so if, wherever you go, you'll see one or two vacant spaces. Uh, and San Francisco was the first city to really go whole hog on this. And uh, the first thing that you should do if you have the money is to hire a graphic designer to show what the problem is. And say on that top block, um, uh, there are too many cars. There's, there's a shortage of parking. Uh, on the bottom, bottom block, uh, there are several vacant spaces, and maybe the merchants there are losing customers. If they had uh, two more cars on that block, maybe they would be more uh, customers for the restaurants or the stores or whatever. So if we nudge the price up on the top block and nudge it down on the bottom block, we would get something like this. Now, some people say that you know, this intrusion of the price system is that we're not used to the price system for anything else, for gasoline and tires and cars and insurance and food and everything else, uh, that we're, we're used to having the, all these other prices vary in order to maintain a, a viable. Now, now with Uber and Lyft as well, we know that, that it, when there's high demand, the price of Uber goes up. Uh, so that would be the same with, uh, with, with uh, Parker. Some people think this is uh, too difficult a social change. You know, you go from New Orleans where most of the par on street park is free, and if there's a meter, it's $1.50 an hour everywhere. And going to this idea of uh, different prices in different places, that sounds uh, just uh, uh, too shocking in order to, to be politically feasible uh, here. It's almost like the Reformation or Prohibition or something like that. But if we can't handle nudging one car from the top block to the bottom block, what can we do in this, in this society? If we can't handle that, what are we capable politically of doing? Uh, so I'm just recommending the Goldilocks principle of parking prices. Not too high, not too low, but just right. Anders, can you explain why you had to include parking minimums? We had, uh, we thought that the market would take care of itself in terms of the required, in terms of the required parking. And the original smart code had no parking requirement. And then we always found that somebody filled it in. There was no such thing. There was no such thing as a vacuum. Excuse Some lawyer me. would actually put in the. Okay, just finish. There's no such thing, in my opinion, as having no parking requirement. Because as soon as you throw it over the wall, somebody comes in and adds it. So what the smart code does is a complex little formula that reduces parking according to mixed use. What it does is a method of incentivizing mixed use. But all the early smart codes always got filled in by somebody else in terms of the parking count. I don't know whether well, you've I, learned what to do. Yes, I, I think I have. I've talked to a number of people. The, there's a lean smart code, isn't there? The lean smart code has no minimum parking requirements. So I think it is possible. And I am I am saying that, that I'm attacking the idea that, 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 that anybody knows how many parking spaces to require. I think I'm, I'm trying to create the, the uh, uh, 
the impression in more people's minds that parking requirements are a bad thing. You're not the last actor. What I've found is that I'm not the last actor. When I, when I put a code and it gets passed, it's still open to modification. And every single smart code that I ever implemented was yet without a parking requirement, had the parking requirement filled in later. So I figured I might as well do it myself. Mm -hmm. Now, there may be maximums that you can put in, but I don't think you can leave a void because someone will fill it. You, you don't think they can be eliminated for political reasons? Someone will fill it. Yeah. Well, that's right. Well, some cities have, have gone beyond the, the, the smart code. The, the center cities, they don't have any minimum at all. They have maximum. So they have gone beyond what the smart code itself says. So I'm trying to develop a political uh, support for the idea of no minimum parking requirements. And I can't think of that any new urbanist would say that's a bad idea, do you? Oh, not at all. It's just an implementation issue. Of, yeah, instead of the other team, essentially, providing too much. Team yet. Yeah. We, have not been, we haven't exterminated the other people, and they can still act after we're gone. That's my right. right. That's so, so better us than them do that. Now, are you against parking maximums? I think it would be better if you were if we could convince the American Planning Association that these minimum requirements are a terrible idea that are poisoning our cities with too much parking. And I, I'd have to say that most of my audience is urban planners rather than new urbanists. So, um, I think I was. Uh, meeting it with uh, uh, Stefano's Palazzoidi's house, and there were a bunch of new urbanists, and they they uh, uh, asked, finally, they said, well, what do you think, uh, Professor Schubert? I said, well, I don't know. I, I'm not that, uh, I'm not such an expert on on uh, the new urbanism. I'm really on the fringe version. I remember what Winston Churchill said about, uh, do you belong to the Church of England? And he said, well, I am to the Church of England like a f flying buttress is to a cathedral. We both support it from the outside. And I think if you can get people on the outside, saying that we are doing a terrible job with, with, with uh, uh, parking requirements. It'll help uh, new urbanists everywhere. Now, let me see. So, uh, is that show there? Okay. Well, here, here's a video showing what p other people said could never happen. Um, Finding a parking space parking. can be frustrating and time-consuming. It's estimated close to a third of city traffic is caused by drivers circling while looking for a space. Some drivers just give up and double park. This clogs our streets and needlessly pollutes the air. These cars slow down public transit and get in the way of emergency vehicles. And drivers focused on finding parking create a hazard for pedestrians and cyclists. There is a better way. San Francisco is testing new parking technology and a flexible approach to pricing that is designed to make parking work better for everyone. SF Park's goal is to have at least one parking space available per block. That way drivers can park near a specific destination without the need to circle the block or double park. This also provides a steadier flow of customers for business owners. SF Park provides safer and clearer streets for everyone. Here's how it works. Newly installed parking sensors detect when a parking space is available. Drivers will be able to check parking availability and rates online, by text message, and by smartphone before heading to their destination. This will help people decide whether to drive, take public transit, bike, or walk. When people choose to drive, new SF Park meters will make paying easier. In addition to taking coins, the new meters will accept credit cards and SFMTA parking cards. Parking time limits will be extended. Easier payment and extended time limits will help drivers avoid tickets. Prices at city-owned parking garages will be adjusted to provide an attractive alternative to meter parking. Parking rates will be adjusted based on demand, once a month, never by more than 50 cents. So, in areas where it seems nearly impossible to find a parking space, rates will increase until at least one space is available most of the time. And in areas where open parking spaces are plentiful, rates will decrease until most of the empty spaces fill, or until rates bottom out at as little as 25 cents per hour. SF Park is designed to ensure that drivers easily find an open space near their destination. 
SF Park will help people plan. But it's been going now for uh, several years, and you can see some of the results here in Fisherman's Wharf, and. Um, it surprised me as to how different the prices are from one block to the next. There's a different price, uh, a separate price on every block, can be. And there are separate prices before noon, from noon to three, and from after three. And uh, it just seems amazing that prices can be um, uh, 50 cents an hour on one block and $1.50 an hour on the other block. But that's only the result of market pricing. If the spaces were half empty, what more? Could, what can see you other than reduce the price of parking until it fills up, as they say? And the um, the results have been pretty dramatic. The um, average time hunting for parking that drivers reported fell by almost half. That there's less traffic driving around, interfering with pedestrians, polluting the air that the pedestrians are breathing, uh, interfering with bicyclists, uh, congesting traffic, slowing buses, uh, double parking, um, and the greenhouse gases, of course, uh, reduce. And you could you can uh, get a lot of mileage by saying that if you could associate a reduction in greenhouse gases with the policy. Now, people say it's so difficult, but look at. The, to, to deal with these prices, but look at here's uh, pictures of parking uh, meet, uh, signs in New Orleans. Uh, they're even threatening. I mean, to think that prices are difficult to deal with compared to the compared to what? Well, if you try parking in the French Quarter, you have to interpret these strange signs or or get tickets. And some people think that what he's what I'm recommending, the different prices at different times of day and on different blocks, is hard to do because parking meters can't do that. Uh, you'd have to go and constantly reset parking uh, prices at the meters and put on new signs. But they're thinking of the original parking meters. This is, one, this is the first one in the U.S. in 1935. And it's identical to most of the parking meters I see here in New Orleans. So that you put your money in the meter and you hope to get back before your time is out. That's why when they were initially introduced, people thought it was an infernal combination of, a, of a, an alarm clock and a slot machine. And people thought they were just a way for the city to get money. Well, the newer meters are, are, are totally different. Here's one on the UCLA campus. Uh, the uh, sign next to it tells how to use it, but it doesn't say what the price is. You don't know what the price is until you touch any button on the machine and it tells you the price at that location at that time. And you can see it's $3 for the first hour and $4 for the second hour. There are different prices at different times of day and in different uh, days of the week at the weekend. Although most of you probably suspect that professors have a lot of spare time, so I set up my camera on a tripod across from eight spaces. There are typically eight curb spaces on a, on a, on a city block. And I uh, took pictures every four minutes saying, well, what happened as a result of this? And you see somebody, the meter is at the far left. Uh, this is right next to the UCLA Law School. Um, and usually there's somebody paying at the meter. So I, you'll see the shadows move as I keep, kept taking pictures. Usually, usually there'll be one or two open spaces on the block. And four minutes later, there's one left and one came. There's still one space. Isn't that what you want to see when you arrive at your destination? Don't you want to have that easy availability? The parking is well used, but is readily available. You can't get any better than that. Here's a, you know, another change. And once there was all the spaces were occupied, which was had been the case before when all the prices were the same all day long, but then you can see people come and go, but usually there's one or two open vacant spaces, sometimes there's more than one. Um, uh, so once there was three, but that didn't last very long. But there's usually one. Now, isn't this what you would like to have in your city? If you were a merchant, wouldn't you like to see that happening on the street in front of your store? Um, does parking work that way in your city? Does it work that way in Lafayette? Not yet. No. But it is possible. I'm saying it is possible. Um, and, and here's uh, just a bar graph to, to show you're a planner. You have to produce a bar graph. But most of the time, there's one vacant space. Sometimes two, sometimes one, once three. But you're probably not going to get any better than this. Is 
What's, what's that? Was the Mercedes a professor or a student? Oh, I'm sorry. The was the Mercedes, Mercedes didn't move all day? The Mercedes? Well, the two of the two cars didn't move at all right now. I mean, this is two hours. I just look for one hour. If they, I can assure you on the UCLA campus, if they stayed there all day, they'd get a ticket at about five minutes past the, 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 uh, the, the, into the third hour. So what is the right price of curb parking? I say you can't tell without, without looking at the results. In fact, that's all you have to do is look at the results. There's, you don't need a consultant to tell you what the right price is. You don't have to look at cities nearby and see what the right price is. You just look at the results on that street. Um, is the lowest price you could charge to still have one or two vacant spaces, uh, um, and the price is just right. Uh, um, it'll, it varies by time of day and from block to block, depending on how desirable they are. Uh, it, it's, uh, can anybody here tell me a better way to set the price of parking? I, in fact, I wonder, can anybody here tell you how your city sets the price of parking? See, I've often asked anybody in the city, how do you set parking prices? And nobody can explain it. Uh, it's so I think the parking price is like the Supreme Court's definition of pornography, is I know it when I see it. And that's the only way um, um, to, uh, to do it. I think politicians are the wrong people to set parking prices. Um, so I think one of the things that will make this possible, uh, uh, I think, is a, a new uh, policy in this uh, part of the world, is pioneered by Miami Beach, is to give discounts at parking meters for residents of the city. Say, in New Orleans now, the price of parking is $1.50 an hour everywhere in the city, is that right? Uh, and it, the meters stop operating at 6 o'clock in the evening in New Orleans, in the French Quarter. Now, even the people who beg for a living are working until midnight in New Orleans, and the parking meters quit work at 6 p.m. Now, I think it would be much more sensible for New, York, New Orleans to run the parking meters late in the evening with no time limit um, and charge the right price for curb parking. Since it would all be new money, you could use it to help homeless people. I think that does New Orleans think it's a better idea to turn the meters off at 6 p.m., lose a lot of money that they could have been used to help homeless people or, or anything else the city wants to do. So anyway, the uh, way to make this popular is that Miami Beach gives residents a discount at parking meters. So if this were happening in... Um, New Orleans at meters, maybe the, 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 the tourists would see the meter says $3 an hour. And they would be grateful to see a space available. But if the resident went there with their license plate number registered in New Orleans, they might pay $1.50 an hour. It's rather like a hotel tax that you could raise money without putting an undue burden on the local residents. I think is a very good policy. Uh, other cities give a discount uh, to residents. Uh, their municipal garage in the first hour or two is free. Um, uh, Denver gives a, uh, a discount if they're parking ride lots for residents of the city. Um, and in England, they do some of the similar things. So give, I'm trying to say, how can this, these ideas be made politically feasible? And I think a new policy is to give resident discounts at parking meters. And the reason we want to have parking meters is to eliminate all this cruising for parking. Um, that uh, here was the, uh, when I was speaking in New York, I took a picture of the a parking meter right outside the hotel. I think it was a dollar an hour. And look at the prices in the uh, parking garage across the street. Very weird prices because they have a, uh, uh, an absurdly precise tax on the space, what, 18.375% or something like that. So it'd be $20 for the first hour. Now, how many people would say, well, I'll pay $20 an hour rather than hundred around for a few minutes to see if I can get a curb space. If you were going to park for an hour, it'd be much more sensible to try to get a curb space than to pay right away. Uh, so it, uh, and the city is really telling you to, to, to cruise. Uh, that if, if you, I think if you cruised for six minutes, that's a tenth of an hour to save 
um, at Valdez Space uh, that saved you $19. You're making $19 an hour. The city is paying you $19 an hour to hunt around congesting traffic and polluting the air. Um, and this, these, this has been known for a long time. Here was a study done in uh, Chicago before World War II. They hired students to stand at every intersection and note the license plate number of every car as it went by and whether it went left or right or straight ahead. And then they could uh, 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 infer the path that the car had traveled from all these data. You see some people, like on the lower left, they were obsessed about parking at one block, and the other people were more open to new experiences, and th things will be better on the next block, although you, it always seems like an unfair operation. That you hope, but you know that other people are having much better luck. Uh, and there have been a lot of studies of cruising for parking, starting appropriately in Detroit in 1927 when they did the same thing, uh, looking at cars as they went by and tracking their path, and they found that either, uh, uh, they looked at either the share of traffic that's cruising or the, uh, how long it took to take, to, to find a curb space, it's about a third of where they were looking for, which is where the, the parking is, it was all free then in 1927, uh, because the parking meter wasn't invented until 1935. Uh, but uh, either they were, uh, about a third of the traffic might have been cruising in those places where they looked. Uh, they only looked in places where they expected to find it. Um, in New York, they have a new uh, system of looking at it. Uh, they uh, interviewed drivers stopped at traffic lights and asked them if they were cruising for curb parking. And in Manhattan, 28% of the drivers on one street said yes. And then on a more residential street in Brooklyn, it was about uh, 45% because there was no reason to be on the street uh, unless you were cruising for parking. You know, it wasn't a through street going anywhere. Um, um, so here's the uh, before that I think uh, we see on many streets uh, that afterwards uh, we found in Westwood Village, if you raise the price, you get about one open space on every block. And then I think the way to make this, uh, this, this um, parking karma solution, the right price for parking uh, possible is to generate political support by using the, the, the money to pay for uh, uh, public investments on the meter streets. Most people look at parking meters this way, and they look at parking uh, city authorities this way, transportation planners this way, that the money might as well be given to the UN or to uh, aid uh, anybody throughout the world. Uh, but when, here's a picture uh, right outside the LA Coliseum, uh, near the Coliseum, in a residential area near the Coliseum during the 84 Olympics, but they were doing then what they do at every event at the Coliseum is they park their own cars on the street and they, uh, they rent their driveways out for uh, use. I mean, we didn't become a great nation by being a bunch of freeloaders, but we are freeloaders when it comes to parking. We all want to park free, and the city councils know that. Uh, but when somebody knows they're getting the money, they understand that we should charge the right price. And one of the best examples of dedicating the money to pay for uh, curb parking uh, happened in, in Old Pasadena, which uh, most people are too young to know, it used to be a, a skid, commercial skid row. That almost everything was vacant above the ground floor, and many of the ground floor stores were, uh, were, um, were empty. And here's what it looks like now. It's one of the uh, most popular tourist destinations in Southern California. What Andre said was, once you get a few blocks that look great, it becomes world famous, at least famous in the United States. And old Pasadena is famous for looking good. Um, uh, how did that happen? Well, I think a large part of it came from parking meters with returning the revenue to pay for um, uh, public improvements in old Pasadena. The city wanted to put in parking meters, but the merchant said, no way, it'll, it'll chase away the few customers we have. And they argued for two years until the city said, if we put in the parking meters, we'll spend all the revenue in Old Pasadena. And like that, they, that's different. Why didn't you tell us that? Let's run the meters till midnight. Let's run them on Sunday. The only thing that's different was that they, they, they had a vision of what they wanted to become. 
but they had no way to pay for it. And this is it. Here's a way to pay for repairing all of your sidewalks, planting new street trees, having new street furniture, and it'll all come from drivers who, who visit here and enjoy it. So the, the property owners didn't pay anything. Uh, so they wanted to uh, operate the meters for a long time, and now the meters yield over a million dollars a year for this tiny business district. To uh, They steam clean the sidewalks twice a month, they sweep them every night, they remove graffiti every night, if there is any, there is hardly any anymore. They have extra police protection, and it's all paid for by the parking meters. And of course they had a graphic artist to say before all of these things became available, they had to uh, convince people that good things were going to happen. Uh, so they hired a graphic artist to explain it. Uh, here's a quote from the uh, uh, president of the uh, Parking Meter Advisory Board. They have to. They have a city. Uh, appointed uh, group who were uh, to, to create a nexus between the city and the, uh, the, and the neighborhood. Um, and what she said in the end, uh, when we found that the money would stay here, that the money would be issued, used to improve the amenities, it was an easy sell. Well, how many people have heard of parking meters being an easy sell? Well, the only thing that made it an easy sell was to say that if we put in the parking meters, you'll get the revenue. So here are some before and after. Um, uh, nothing wrong with motorcycles and, and tattoos, but there were tattoo parlors and, 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 and uh, pawn shops and porn theaters beforehand. Now it's quite different. The property owners, uh, once once the city had, had uh, approved all the uh, public infrastructure, uh, then the property owners uh, uh, restored their properties. It didn't make any sense to pay for expensive restorations when the when all the public infrastructure was beat up. But when the city did what only the city can do, which is make the what's in front of the building uh, great, then the property owners came through um, with uh, uh, restoration. The parking meters uh, certainly didn't cause all of this, but they helped pay for all of it. Uh, here was a, most of the buildings were empty above the ground floor. Uh, then they were renovated, taking off the exterior uh, staircases and things like that. Here was an, a, an empty tire warehouse. It'd be empty, it had been empty for more than a decade, and it became a department store without any parking. Um, and a porn theater became a Tiffany's. Now you can't get any more gentrified than that, but the, the, uh, the, there's no sense at all that this is harming poor people. Just think of all the people who are now making a living here, that there are a lot of jobs there, and when you walk on the street, there's every form of humanity on the sidewalk. You can't say it is for rich people. Here are the alleys that were in terrible condition, uh, and then they cleaned them up with meter money and planted trees, and, and now they have uh, sidewalk cafes outside. Um, and so here is what it looks like now, and what had been uh, uh, a terrible shape, generating very little employment and almost no sales tax revenue, and the sales tax revenue shot up when they put in the parking meters. You can see old Pasadena is there. And it isn't because the parking meters were doing such great things for the area, it's the money from the parking meters that were doing great things. If they had put in the, the parking meters and siphoned the money off to pay for pensions or something like that, I don't think Pasadena would have thrived. It's because the parking meter money was spent so that whenever anybody gets out of their car, they get into a beautiful environment. Uh, Ventura is another place in California. They started this, uh, the parking meters with revenue return. Parking meters had been put in in the 50s, but they were taken out after the mayor and all the council were, were called over parking meters. So they, they had it in their DNA that parking meters were a terrible idea. But when they went, uh, tried it again, uh, and uh, said, we'll spend all the money in the neighborhood uh, on the meter street, people were very happy with it. And they surveyed the merchants so they said it was a great idea. And the other thing that surprised me, but the crime rate went down uh, by more than half, I think, because they had to hire police interns to act as a... Uh, 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 
meter enforcement people. So they would just walk up and down, costumed as policemen, and making sure that they gave tickets and explained to people what was happening. So this was another great effect. And a third great effect that I think will have a worldwide effect is that the parking meters have to communicate with City Hall in order to um, uh, you know, have the meter rates change. You don't have to touch a parking meter to change the rates. It's all do done remotely. But also to validate credit cards. So the, the city traffic engineer realized that you didn't, uh, that, that the, uh, uh, there wasn't that much credit card validation. Instead of using cell phones to communicate between the meter and the city hall, he chose Wi-Fi. You have a Wi-Fi, a small, very low power modem in the parking meter because it's battery powered. And then up on the telephone pole or the light pole, there's a router about the size of a shoebox. So the signal goes from the meter to the router and then from the router to city hall. And he realized there was a lot of excess capacity in that router. So they opened up and it's free Wi-Fi for everybody on the metered streets. Everybody who, who's in, in range of that router gets free Wi-Fi. So when they open their laptop at a restaurant, it isn't the restaurant who pays for the Wi-Fi. It says courtesy of the parking service. So if in New Orleans, everybody associated, or in your city, everybody associated a parking meter with free Wi-Fi, I think it would be politically very feasible. Um, now, I went to uh, a frequent visitor here. I was actually a two-lane dropout in 1963, so, so I've watched New Orleans for a very long time. Uh, and there are dead street trees and broken sidewalks and things like that. There are things that, in the French Quarter that could be paid for by meter money that would make it look like a better place. Um, so that's why I think you should have these parking benefit districts that take the meter money and spend it on the meter streets in a very flamboyant way for what's the residents or the property owners and the merchants' highest priority. If they want safety, they should have safety, extra police protection. In old Pasadena, the meter money pays for $400,000 a year worth of more police uh, patrol in the area. That's the biggest use of the money, is to have more police patrol in an area that no longer needs it because there are throngs of people on the sidewalk. So I think it's a, it's a transportation management tool. The meters are justified because they regulate the, this very valuable land. Uh, and in San Francisco, they reduce air pollution, but it's also an economic development tool. And that, I think, is what makes it politically popular, uh, that, uh, that it, uh, it makes curb parking uh, available, increases uh, sales uh, and property tax revenue, and employs more people. It's, uh, it's much better. So I'd like to end where I began, it was in Silicon Valley is that we're starting out with a world like this. How do we go morph from a place like this to a decent place? Uh, you could imagine it happening in Pasadena, which had great bones, but uh, how would you do this in, in uh, Silicon Valley? When you walk around in the parking lot, it's a great place to be if you're a car. There's a, there's a beautiful environment, it's, it's, it's a great climate, just where, you, where everybody would like to live. But this is what it looks like. How do you go from there? Well, I spoke about this first to a new urbanist conference when it was in Pasadena, and I very hurriedly uh, created uh, Photoshop to take buildings from the University of London and said, well, we could use, we could put liner buildings around there. If you remove the off-street parking requirements and you charge for the on-street parking, uh, then you could build on these, on the periphery of these parking lots. It's all under one ownership. There's no land assembly problem. It's not polluted. It's not brown fields. It's, it's prime real estate, right where people want to live, right next to jobs, um, it, where the land is fabulously expensive and people complain about long commutes and high housing prices and things like that. Talk about jobs housing balance. Well, I don't think we would have buildings like that in the Silicon Valley. So um, I took a sort of a garden variety apartment building from downtown Los Angeles to because I was talking to people in Silicon Valley and said, well, you could just have a building like this. Uh uh, six-story building, um, and it, if you simply permitted Cisco to say, well, I'll experiment with building uh, apartment buildings on the perimeter of this parking lot. And if that worked out and they made money, they could give discounted prices to their own employees or they could have a market rate, um, and they could build another. 
it's totally incremental if the city allowed it. See, the city won't allow it now because the parking is required for the office building and they would have to have more parking for the housing. So that's difficult. But if the city just gets out of the way and says, uh, and here's uh, what the building looks like in, in, in context in, in Los Angeles, has a, uh, I think a daycare center and shops on the ground floor and housing above. Uh, but you could have anything on the periphery of this. You could have garden apartments, you could have uh, uh, commercial buildings, uh, just so long as the city allowed it. Uh, so I think uh, there are a lot of benefits that would happen from this if the city got out of the way. Uh, that you could certainly have increased the housing supply right where the jobs are, um, and it would certainly reduce the time that people waste on commuting and the cars and fuel that they buy, often which are imported, um, uh, and you uh, would have less traffic congestion and air pollution. Maybe it would slow down climate change. Um, so I think there's some many benefits from this. That uh, it, it, for new buildings, you could uh, it would reduce the number of parking space you have to supply. And one thing that even planners have a hard time understanding at times that it means that it'll be more uses that cities will allow because they can't say you can't use this building for housing because it doesn't have the required parking. If there aren't any parking requirements, then anything can be converted into anything else. And I think the best example of this happened in LA where they removed the off-street parking requirements if you convert a historic building into housing. Previously, it couldn't be done uh, because the planners would say, where's the required parking? Um, and the uh, LA uh, formally required two spaces per um, uh, uh, condo unit and then um, uh, it was at a t the place was in, in, in um, um, a terrible condition before this this happened. Um, 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 mainly winos. Uh, the, the, then the, uh, they had adopted the adaptive reuse ordinance, which I think would be appropriate for any city in the United, any city of the world, um, and said that you could convert uh, empty office buildings into housing without any new parking. And there were wonderful buildings in downtown LA that had been empty above the ground floor ever since urban renewal uh, on Bunker Hill drained the life out of Spring Street, which had been called the Wall Street of the West. Here's one of these uh, uh, office buildings. They're just terrific, but the only, uh, they were too expensive to tear down. They, they had commerce on the ground floor, but not above. Uh, they're just terrific buildings now, terrific places to live. Uh, and uh, there's something like 57 of them were converted into housing. They said that downtown LA has the largest collection of intact uh, office buildings for the early 20th century in the country. And, but they were, they, they had been in disrepair for a long time. And just think of all the people who were employed, the, all the architects, all the planners, all the urban designers, all the plasterers and upholsterers and electricians and plumbers who were employed converting these empty office buildings into housing. Um, it, I, I think that was formerly a parking garage converted into housing. Here's a Federal Reserve Bank converted into housing. Now this was the parking garage that was converted into housing. It was an old one with elevators and it had flat plates. It was, it was an old parking garage that you got from floor to floor on an elevator. And the developers, uh, they did provide uh, parking spaces, usually not on site because there's no way to put a parking space into an old building. Uh, so I think these are the buildings that have been saved by reducing off-street parking requirements. And of course, many of the people who buy there without, uh, without uh, a parking space live healthier lives. They walk more, they bike more. Uh, so I think if, if you want to reduce all this unnecessary vehicle travel and traffic congestion, air pollution, energy waste, greenhouse gas emissions, um, and if you want to do all of these things and do it quickly, you get the price right, which is some cities are doing, and which any city can do. Um, uh, uh, spend the revenue to, in a flamboyant way to benefit neighborhoods uh, so that the merchants or the residents will say, yes, I want this, do it in my backyard. 
Um, and then you could remove the off-street parking requirements. Well, what will you do with uh, all the parking spaces, we, uh, all the cars that we, that we don't need anymore? Well, here's a sculpture in France I like called Long-Term Parking. <laughs> And what about all these garages that we have? I showed two of them in, in the French Quarter. What are we going to do with them? Here's one in Holland. They found a nice use for that. <laughs> um, well, a, a planter can't end with uh, any better uh, ending than quoting from uh, Jane Jacobs. Uh, and I think she's, she's as always, as usually spot on. Uh, we, we don't live in a rich nation because we built it. We, we inherited a rich nation. And I don't think we are uh, doing enough for future generations. Um, uh, here's a quote from President Eisenhower in his famous farewell address uh, uh, as he was leaving office. And I think we are plundering uh, for our own ease and convenience the precious resources of tomorrow in a way that President Eisenhower could never have imagined. I think you know, future generations looking back at us will think, what did these people think they were doing? Um, and of course, our greatest uh, uh, writer or president was Abraham Lincoln. I think our case is due. We have a lot of new technology. We have a lot of new problems, climate change, uh, air pollution, um, unemployment. And I think, you know, I hope that, that I help people to think anew and act anew. Um, well, that's about all I know, so I better stop. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. All right. Does anyone have a question? Yes. Thank you so much for being here. I heard you speak a couple of years ago when you were here for the ULI meeting, and you spoke at the National World War II Museum. At that time, you mentioned something about residential parking passes that were not working, I think, in the French Quarter. And we have, I live in an urban neighborhood. We're facing some parking pressures. We need a parking management strategy. Possibly residential parking passes might be one of the solutions. How do we do that right so that it works? Well, you do it the way most other cities do it. <laughs> That it, 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 the residential parking permit programs are one of the simplest things to do. Um, uh, I, I stayed at the Soniat House the last time I was here in New Orleans, which is in the French Quarter, and the, uh, the woman who managed it, a wonderful woman, she came to my talk, and when I showed the picture of the broken sidewalk, she said, well, that's right in front of our hotel. And she lived right across, uh, all the, hmm? right outside the, the French quarter she had a she had a permit was it her she had a uh, a, a permit that she uh, gave to a friend she said it happens all the time the permits are sold from one person to another uh, there's so much abuse I mean New Orleans is famous for this that's why I think that that it would be better to make it a commercial transaction that it would be money that could be spent to repair the quarter um, it's very valuable land I think that people who, who want per permit Permit parking districts off, but they want to park free in front of their own house. I think is that there are a lot of reasons to charge for parking, but politically it's difficult because we all want to park free. And I think the only way to get around that is to say, if we charge for parking, here's what you can have. In fact, I would say start off by saying, what would you like to have? and then say, here's a way to pay for it. So if you found some things in the French Quarter that people really did want, and say, well, here's a way to pay for it. We'll run the meters till midnight. Of course, you would take off the time limits of the evening so that people could pay, park all night long in the meter if they paid. And you say, well, we, we, we could raise the price. We could, we could give parking discounts to New Orleans residents, but most of, a lot of people here are tourists. I would make less of a governmental decision and more of a, a, a market decision. I think we've made a lot of mistakes by 
by making it, parking a political issue rather than a, a market issue. And I think the way to build political support for changing that is to say, here's what the money can get you. That, uh, that at, at a place like the French Quarter, most people don't own a car. It's a very small percentage of people, actually, who park on the street in places like the French Quarter. So you're giving a big subsidy to a small group of people who are probably richer than the average at the expense of something that everybody could have. I know it's, it's not that easy, but uh, uh, cities are moving in this direction. And I think New Orleans would be a good place to start because you have so many outsiders who could be paid for. You start from such a, a, a bad policy of $1.50 everywhere at meters. It's turning them off at 6 p.m. I think that the, the, the benefits that could come from better management in New Orleans would be fantastic. Um, Thank Dr. you. Dr. Shu, can you come over here? We're, uh, video, we're videotaping this, oh, so they would like you sort of generally in here. Okay. We've got another question. One real quick question is, what is the opposition in New Orleans to reforming parking in a way that Dr. Shoup suggests? Can anybody speak to that? Yeah, why would you not want to charge just the right price for parking in New Orleans? Sure, so uh, my name is Matt Rufo. I'm a transportation consultant here in New Orleans and mindful of a lot of parking issues going on. A lot of opposition comes from people who think that a, a lot of the opposition stems from folks who are very skeptical, very cynical about the purpose of the raising of the parking revenue. A lot of people think of it as a um, s means simply to raise revenue. And in previous discussions in which the city has proposed raising parking prices, they do put it in those terms, actually. The, political the public officials say this increase in parking price will result in this much more tax revenue. Uh, and so if there was a more broad discussion about the many benefits of pricing parking according to its actual market price, that being less cruising um, and much more availability of parking for people and much more turnover, then I think there'd be a lot more uh, receptiveness among the general public to these these ideas. Great. If you just pass it, the microphone back to her, and then if uh, Dr. Shoup would like to speak to that, do, do you have any additional? Oh, yes. I, I, th I think so. Uh, I've given up on the idea of saying this will slow global warming or reduce air pollution or pedestrian deaths or anything like that. That doesn't move people's minds. Uh, but when I spoke in Ventura before they uh, uh, put in their policy, uh, I stayed a couple of days afterwards and uh, went to restaurants and, and uh, talked to a lot of people. And all, about every restaurant I went into, the uh, manager would come up and say, oh, I loved your talk last night. It was, I, I think it's such a good idea. I said, well, what do you like about the reducing traffic congestion or air pollution? And they looked at me as though I was the dumbest person on earth. And they said, no, it's the money that you have to appeal. <laughs> Use the money talks. And I think you let the money do the talking. That if you get support from a group who wants something, like replant dead street trees or um, uh, repair broken sidewalks or something like that and say, well, here's a way to pay for it. Will your neighborhood council uh, uh, suggest this? And I think uh, in an area that's very dense where most people cannot park on the street, you will find a great majority of people who will benefit and a small minority who now park on the street who will see some cost. But even the people who park on the street will be better off if they be guaranteed a place to park. Okay. John Anderson, do you have a question? Um, yeah. Actually, Dan Zach once told me that parking is such a volatile issue with so many hallucinations associated with it that no matter what you do, people will be upset, including if you do nothing. <laughs> and the, uh, so in Albuquerque, where I live, we've been doing we have the do nothing approach and people are really upset. Um, and in, in the, the trendy retail restaurant area called Knob Hill, 
Um, they have uh, their pricing for clearance. They're kind of, you know, at an adolescent stage. They're, mm -hmm. they're probably into their next generation of new equipment where you can do it with the phone and stuff. But the problem is showing up one block off with the spillover parking into the residential area where everyone still believes you should park free in front of your house. Mm -hmm. And that's where the people in the green aprons from Starbucks are parking. Mm -hmm. And so what, what we're trying to get done uh, at a local level is to say get, uh, they, they want resident parking, resident parking only. So to get a hang, yeah, you get a sticker or a hang tag, or if you want to buy a chance to buy, uh, park there during the day, it mm -hmm. costs you money, and that goes into fixing the playground equipment and everything else. Have you seen, in the places that don't have uh, uh, meters and fancy, fancy stuff, where it's uh, permit parking, the ability to buy a parking permit to park there during the day? Oh yes, some cities do that, especially around universities. Uh, that uh, if you're if you're near a university and it's a single family neighborhood, it's usually plagued by students parking in front of your house. So they ask for parking permit districts, and that excludes all students and everybody who works at the university. I think as soon as you move away from the freeloading uh, uh, view of parking into the paying guest view of parking and see where the money goes, it's, it works very well. So I would say they call non-resident daytime permits. All right, we've got two questions, one here and one in the back, and then we're going to take a break. Two comments. One is that um, my experience, I have another hat on, you know, in terms of real estate, you know, another part of my life. Uh, and uh, I've dealt with planning departments all over Southern California outside of Los Angeles. And to give a little kudos to planners, they're starting to interpret, and now I have this standard conversation now, when we do a TI turnover, a change use, that would kick in all the new requirements and make, you know, we couldn't do it. They'll interpret those ratios as maximum demand. And I go, okay, I'll get you a shared use parking study. And there's traffic engineers, it's like a cottage industry now. Thousands and thousands of dollars. We just put it to the pricing model and include it in the rent. It's like a standard thing now uh, that we do. And, and of course the customers end up paying it in the higher lease rates. Uh, but the point by being, I, why don't you guys change? We just need a source, we need a reference, we need something that we can reference and we can change that. So the planners are trying to do a lot of work around, but you're having to do uh, very expensive shared use parking studies to do the work around. So please, if we could influence somebody to give a reference, please. Well, second, I uh, real quick point, second point. In Ventura, I know Ventura intimately, uh, uh, and one of the issues has been with those machines, that they're pretty well accepted, but the lack of display pricing from when you're parking, are any of these machines being designed where you can see the price when you're parking? Because what's happening in Ventura is people doing a fear factor thing. They're parking a couple blocks away where it's one or two hour parking because they last time they parked when uh, you know they had to chart they you know they knew what the price was. I don't know the price is lowered, and so what happens is you're getting many spaces on Main Street empty because they can't, they don't have the real-time display pricing for the people coming into park. And that would be, it's a real flaw in the design. Just want to mention that. Well, y yes, I think that as I showed you at the UCLA meter, it shows you the price right away. Uh, you can't see it from the car. Oh no, but you can't see the price of the parking meter at any parking meter from a car. If you drive, have you ever parked at a meter where you saw beforehand what the price was? I wish someone would think it away. Uh, well, in San Francisco, in San Francisco, I showed you that there is a um, uh, a website. If you're really concerned about it uh, and you want to save money, you can look on the website and see what the price is. Um, but uh, uh, in terms of the shared parking, I think in Redwood City, it was a planner who I think put one over on the city council. They, they adopted this uh, variable pricing uh, with revenue return. And the, uh, the planner convinced the city council to, to simplify the, uh, the parking code. Instead of having different parking requirements for shoe stores and restaurants and everything else, they adopted one parking requirement of three spaces per thousand square feet for everything. Three spaces per thousand square, square feet for everything. And that means any store can be converted into any other store. 
because they're all grandfathered in. Even if they have no parking spaces, they can become a restaurant. And what happened was restaurants, which have very high parking requirements, exploded in downtown Redwood City because they had been prohibited by the change of use ordinance and parking requirements. So it didn't sound like much to say that we'll have one parking requirement for everything, but it made, and this would be something in the smart code. They don't have parking requirements for each separate use, and that makes every use sort of, uh, it's, the uses are fungible. Add something. I want to also follow on that. Uh, we were working in uh, Jackson, Mississippi several years ago, and every restaurant we went to was this beautiful building with a really nice porch where you could eat your good food, and you were always overlooking a parking lot. And so because of my legal background, I said, there's got to be a law that says you have to look over a parking lot if you've got a restaurant. And sure enough, we went to look at the code, and the code said you had to have 13 spaces for 1,000 square feet of restaurant. And uh, what did that mean? That meant that they couldn't build a city. They were scratching their heads about, well, why can't we redevelop downtown? You couldn't redevelop downtown or create any uh, urbanized area in Jackson, Mississippi, because the code was going to prevent you from doing it altogether. You want to add something, Anders? Uh, parking is power. Okay, Parking is what you can, how much you can build in the real world. And one of the things you can do by reducing it, which Dr. Shoup just said, is by reducing the parking, you actually can incentivize things from happening. A couple of anecdotes that have worked for us. One is that you can provide the parking. If you must have the parking to keep, satisfy the bankers and the loan officers, you can have the parking within a five minute walk. And you can actually go through the fiction that it's been assigned in some parking garage somewhere so that the banker can actually get it off the checklist. Because right now, more and more, it has nothing to do with the planner. It has to do with a mortgage that has to be resold. And we're actually we're having a crisis now in Seaside for the following reason. Bear in mind what's happening, because everything's actually trending the wrong way. Apartment buildings at Seaside did not have parking. The apartments did not. They were fungible. They, were, they could be interchangeable anywhere with the retail, right? Much more efficient because it's not assigned and, and left, left fallow during the day. Well, the people who had finally their $2 million apartments found they couldn't resell them because the new mortgage requirements by the appraisers, the new appraisers require two parking spaces assigned. So some absolutely impossibly distant protocol has actually made it impossible to sell the apartments at Seaside unless they have two assigned parkings. So at the same time that we're discussing here, there's something very off going on somewhere else. And more and more it's the appraisers and the mortgages on automatic protocol. Now here's another thing that actually worked very well. It's very similar to what Dr. Shoup did. When we were in, in uh, Naples, Florida, it was absolutely dead. It was empty in the first floor. And we found that the parking on street had been striped back in 1950 with 27 foot spaces plus five foot walk spaces in between, you know, for Cadillacs with fins. <laughs> It was absolutely amazing, with 32 feet per car. So we found that on a four block area, we could restripe it to normal requirement and found that we had over 200, we had 220 additional cars for the price of paint. But what we said is, what we said is, okay, we have a four story town center here and we have 220 spaces to give away at four per thousand. Whoever comes first gets, gets the cars assigned to them. The fiction of you get assigned, whoever comes later has to build their own. So what we did is we actually put a time, a, a time fuse on who goes first. Because one of the problems with redevelopment is they say, sure, we're going to do what you say, but who's going to go first? Who's going to be the pioneer? So one of the things about downtown redevelopment is you have to incentivize the pioneer. And the pioneer may be the person who actually doesn't have to comply with parking requirements. Say, we suspend parking requirements for four years. No parking required for four years. But by that time, we're going to need it. We're going to have a need. And those after four years are going to have to provide it. And that puts a real incentive on, on the time factor. Because we have a time factor problem, which is everybody hates to be the pioneer. And we need to reward those who go first. And I think actually using parking creatively, like Dr. Shoup spoke about, I mean, really creatively to incentivize, incentivize other policies is, is really, really powerful and really inexpensive to do. Uh, all right, Jeff, you had one question, and then we're going to break. 
Yeah, Dr. Shoup, I uh, have more of a theoretical question. Um, I was fascinated by your pragmatic pricing model because you're actually facing a, a Ramsey pricing problem where you have a monopolist, the government, trying to set a price in a way that maximizes social welfare. And your definition of social welfare would be, you know, just having one space open per block. Um, and I was thinking, did you, when you were thinking about this, did you think about other ways to define the social welfare, like how to maximize that social welfare, i.e., how much revenue or how much business um, you could do if you set a different price model for those shops along a certain street, or how many bikes actually were in use, or how many people walked? I was just wondering if you thought other ways about how to maximize the social welfare. Well, I, I think everything else is, is is very complicated. I mean, it's very simple to say we want more open space so that the city council leaders can look out the window and see if the, the goal is being met. The city council should be a policy-making organization, not a price-setting organization. They ought to say, what do we want to see? And I think that anything other than saying we want to see the parking working well uh, is probably going to be too complicated complicated to, to monitor, to say we want, um, I, I don't, don't know exactly what else you would tell the, the parking managers. It's difficult enough to get the price right, even if you know you just want one, one space uh, per block. But no, I think we ought to simplify it rather than, than complicate it, and I think that uh, it would be very hard to explain anything other than one or two open spaces on a block to the public, to the goal, to explain it in a political meeting. Yeah, I think the, the question really stemmed from um, what, what happens when you have a, a low demand so that you still might want to have a fairly high price on the parking. Um, for other reasons, but your your demand is fairly low, and so w 50 cents might end up you having a space every block or two, and in, in that situation, is that the correct price, or should you be looking at for a, a different way to set that price? Well, in San Francisco, 17% of all the spaces went down to 25 cents an hour. That's what people were very surprised about, is that the more prices went down than up, especially in the morning. I meant to look at it at 8 o'clock this morning. How many parking spaces do you think you're occupied outside this building, around this area at 8 o'clock when the parking meters stop. I think when the demand is low, $1.50 an hour is too high. And then after 6 o'clock, free is too low. So I, no, I, 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 I don't think that it's reasonable to say we, we want to do something other than manage the parking properly because, I mean, if there, there are all kinds of coffee shops and restaurants that they want people coming in and they, they don't want you to say, well, we're keeping the price up because we want some money. No, I think they ought to uh, surrender and say the price ought to be free in the morning. Say, in, in old Pasadena, the price, the parking meters did start at 8 p.m. That's 8 a.m., I'm sorry. And after a few months, they, uh, the park meters were due, they agreed to start running them at 10 a.m. because there just wasn't a demand in the morning. Well, thank you very much. All right.